Hello everyone, this is John Buck back with another discrete time linear systems video. Uh, this video builds on the discrete Fourier transform overview video. So if you haven't already watched that one, I'd say please go back and watch that one first. Then we're going to pick up here first talking now you have the conceptual background. Uh, we'll look at the actual equations. Uh, then in the next video, I'll, I'll work through and, and, and sort of how it works with the actual equations. Uh, and then the next video, I'll show an example of applying this uh, both uh, on paper here or well, on the screen here, and then also in MATLAB computing things. Okay, so we said, right, the whole idea of the discrete Fourier transform is that this is something practical we're going to compute. We can't compute x sub e to the j omega because there's an infinite set of omegas uh, between 0 and 2 pi. And so instead, we're going to sample them in omega. So we're sort of flipping the coin or you know, turning the world upside down, saying instead of sampling in time, we're sampling in frequency every 2 pi over n. So we get these closely spaced points on the omega axis that we're going to evaluate the equation for. So if we if we do that, we can come up with the equation and say that, well, if, if uh, I have x sub e to the j omega, I can just write it using my sum. of x of n e to the minus j omega n. And then I'm going to evaluate that sum, as I just had above it, at omega equals 2 pi over n k. So that means I'm going to take this frequency and plug it in up here for omega. And so let's see what happens when I do that. If I make that substitution, I get a sum over all time of x of n times e to the minus j omega. And so that omega is now 2 pi over n times k. And then I still have this extra n here, too. I can't leave, forget that. So this says for, for any signal, I can do this. Most of the time when we're applying the DFT, it's a practical thing. So the signal is going to be finite length. right? In practice, We apply the DFT to finite length signals because they're generally signals we've measured somehow by sampling or recording. All right, so when we do that, we, we get the final form, which is x of k is going to be the sum over this finite length signal from 0 to n minus 1 of x of n e to the minus j omega where we replace omega by this 2 pi over n times kn. And this is our analysis equation. Like our other frequency transforms, we're going to have an analysis equation, and then there's a similar synthesis equation. The synthesis equation says if I have x of k, and I want to go back to the time domain, I'm going to do 1 over n, and now I'm summing over k. It's very important not to mix this up. Right, of x of k e to the plus j 2 pi over n kn. So this is my synthesis equation. And again, very important to remember, I'm now summing over k. This is my essentially my frequency index. So I'm counting through the frequencies and so like our other synthesis equation, as I count through the frequencies, what I'm doing is I'm putting my recipe together. X of k is telling me how much of each frequency is present, what is it, how much of it do I, magnitude and phase do I need, and then these are the different ingredients that I'm adding up to make my signal x of n. Okay, so in practice we have our analysis equation, our synthesis equation, and in fact, if, if these look familiar from the Fourier series, they are. They're sort of a nice, satisfying feature of the fact that we've sort of come full circle here, that by wrapping around, um, um, that when we come back to computing Fourier transforms of finite length things, we'll see they have a very deep connection to where we started with computing Fourier transforms for periodic things. And again, just to, to sort of follow up, and before we go to the example in the next video, just to remind us, so what's going on here is if I have a finite length signal here, to just to be uh, careful, we'll have this have a different length. So we'll say the signal is m points long, our whole point in doing this is we want to choose the number of samples n to be large enough to avoid aliasing in time, right? So if n is greater than m, greater than or equal to m, 
right? Remember we said when we sample in frequency, we're making copies in time and then adding them up, right? So we'll get, uh, if I use the, the sort of copy function here, well, first of all, I'll have this one, I'll just copy this down here, right? I'll have a copy at zero, but then I'll also have, if, if n is greater than m, I'll have another copy over here Right, that starts at minus n, but if n is bigger than m, it will end before they overlap. So, and I should mention something here. These are still discrete signals, just for the purposes of figuring out when there is aliasing in time or not. Uh, all that really matters is, is sort of these silhouettes of how long are the signals in time, right? The actual values aren't as important as how wide they are. And this is the, the dual version of what we saw uh, back when we talked about sampling, where we said actually what matters is that the signal is band limited and what frequencies it's band limited to. All right, and just to, to keep these uh, sort of clearer, we could we could say there'll be another copy here. All right, so these are are uh, they should be more exactly the same if I were a better artist. But the main point is they're not overlapping. And so if n is bigger than n, we have no aliasing in time. So we can recover x of n from the samples and frequency. Right? So if I plug, if I took the samples I had in omega and put them on the previous, oh, previous page into this equation for x of k, I would be able to get back the original signal without anything going wrong. But if the number of frequency samples is less than the length of the signal, then we will get aliasing in time. And those copies will overlap and add. We, we add them up when they overlap, and, and then adding the copies destroys information. So what would that look like in these sort of cartoon pictures? Well, let me uh, bring a new copy of my signal down. Don't know why that's still in the way there. Bring this up. But now, right, if n is less than m, that means this this left edge will be inside the signal here, right? So I have something that looks like this, and they'll add up and overlap here. Same thing on the right. When I move just over by minus n, it's not far enough to keep the copies separate, and it adds up here. And so if this is my n, when I reconstruct from the frequency signals, the 0 to n minus 1 I get would be this. Choose a different color for it. Would be this section here. So just short it from 0 to n minus 1. What I would get back would be this, and, and they, these two would be added an alias there. All right, so I wouldn't know what the original signals were because those overlapping copies would have added. And so in the next video, I'll show you an actual, instead of just sort of in conceptual cartoons, I'll show you this happening with an actual signal. Uh, we'll do it in uh, with equations first and then do it in MATLAB as well to show you what the aliasing looks like in practice. Okay, so that's all for this video. I will see you next time.